Although he is best known as one of India's most famous painters, there's actually much more to him than that. He's an artist in the very true sense of the term, and he cares deeply about his fellow human beings. Today, I hope to reveal just a little bit more about his personality as I introduce you to Jatin Das. Welcome to the program. Thank you. you know, you once said, painting is self-discovery. The more I paint, the more I find out about myself. It sounds intriguing, but what exactly do you mean? I suppose it's for everybody. Whatever you do, you discover yourself through that medium. So it's not only for painters. Um, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so in fact, it's a voyage of discovery, your career. You see, um, you see, uh, of course, for myself, but it's the same for everybody. You see, uh, when there's a politician, he wants to become the prime minister. That's the end of that journey. Or a sportsman wants to go to the Olympic. But for a creative person, it's a never-ending journey. You know what I mean? There is no finale. But self-realization is the goal at the end of it. Evolution of yourself and your work and realization, all of it put together. Is this why you often say that when it comes to selling your paintings, it's not buyers you want so much as a home and suitable owners? Because they're actually buying a part of you. Yeah. You see, um, first of all, there are a lot of misnomer. Quite often people ask me, uh, Jatin, are you still painting? The fact you haven't held an exhibition recently. So then idea that as if you're painting for selling or exhibition. So that's a really wrong concept. There are many artists, uh, say Ram Kinkar Beige, uh, never held an exhibition, who was a great artist of the century. Now, uh, it's not necessary what you're, as a, a poet or a painter, what you're doing, it's not necessary to exhibit, number one. Not necessary to sell either if you have had retainership. Um, there are two other reasons that when you paint, uh, you're accumulating your work in the studio. That's one. The other is, since you're living on the sale of your work, you, you, you're not painting for selling, but you live on the sale of your work. So you have to release them also. But nonetheless, when you do sell, you're very particular about who you sell your paintings to. You yeah. don't just simply want them to go to the person who can afford them. He or she yeah. must appreciate them. Sure. Well, I suppose every artist wants that. Mm, but uh, most artists are actually happy to sell because selling is an establishment. It is a recognition. That's not what it is for you, is it? Uh, no. But I, uh, I'm, I'm happy and sad at the same time when I'm selling a work. The work is going out going away from my studio, number one. And I'm also happy because I'm getting some cash to live and to buy material, you know. But there were people, say, in the ancient time, people, sculptors and painters, they worked. And uh, they were given land or property by the Raja. So uh, they d didn't have to sell anything. Would you rather that sort of system still prevail today? Uh, not that system, but uh, if there was a system like, uh, you know, um, you could choose whom to sell, or you could choose when to exhibit, where to exhibit, or if you don't wish to exhibit. But that's why the whole concept of the gallery comes into being. That sometimes when I don't want to sell, uh, I, I don't want to sell my work in my studio, I tell the buyers as they go to the gallery. Your friends mm. say that he's increasingly become disillusioned, even disenchanted with the art scene as it exists in India today. Yeah. You see, quite often people say, oh, the painting is fetching high price. Well, there are a lot many galleries. There are about 180 galleries in New Delhi now. And there are a lot many auctions and people are buying. But you know, in the 60s and 70s until mid-80s, there were people who were interested in works. Artists used to drop it at another artist studio and look at the work. Or there are friends who wouldn't buy, but they would come and see your work and follow your work constantly. You mean today when that people... That is not there. So today mm. when people associate with artists, it's not because they're interested in the work, it's because of the social recognition that they get. That's one. And there are plenty of them come to the exhibition. You don't Very like come the, to the I studio. You don't like the idea that possessing a Jatin Das is a fashionable thing to do. I suppose so. I suppose it is. You see, it's, um, I remember once a lady came from Bombay with a list of names, and she said she liked my work. In the morning, she was to come. And in the morning, she said, your name is not in the list, so I couldn't come and buy your work. You know? So people are buying names instead of the work. Let's go back to the beginning of the Jatinda story. 
because clearly long before you became a name on a list there was a background that you people have perhaps begun to forget about you were born in a principality in Orissa, Mayur Bhanj in 1941 what sort of childhood did you have? well I've come from a middle class family in a princely state um, but a very beautiful little town um, in the east coast of India uh, and bordering Orissa, Bengal and Bihar so you have the tribal pockets, you have the classical and the folk culture. But there were a lot of uh, urban, uh, not urban, but uh, sophisticated fervor in that uh, state. That there were uh, classical music concerts every year. There was a library, Jubilee Library in four acres of land with the rare books, numbered editions Raja had donated. You know, and so there was music and dance and painting and all kinds of things. So, um, uh, it was very enriching, in, in, you know, in my childhood. And then I had a guru. I had a guru uh, when I was a kid. He, he taught yoga. He knew clay modeling, painting. He wrote poetry and he sang. So, you know, it was fantastic. So as a child it. you were exposed to practically all the arts in one shape or another. That's right. But unlike the urban uh, art activity of galleries and theaters and auditoriums, uh, art was a way of life, you know. But it was only really when you were at the JJ School of Art, oddly enough studying architecture at the time, that you committed yourself to painting. What was it that helped you make that decision? You see, I, after school I wanted to go and study art. And my parents and my elder brothers, and they didn't agree, and I joined uh, biology and science to go for medicine. And then I, uh, I was selected uh, for Intercollege Youth Festival for painting. Then I came to Delhi in 1956 for the Inter University Youth Festival and I stood first. And then when I went back, I said, I want to study art. And, and what did the family say? Uh, they said, no. But then I met Julius Vaz, the architect of Bhubaneswar, the capital of Bhub the new capital of Bhubaneswar. So he gave me the name of the dean of the architectural faculty in JJ. He wrote a letter. And then I requested my parents. And I went alone. I'd never been outside Orissa, then Calcutta. So I went on my own in a train at the age of 17 to Bombay. And I went to the dean, and I got admission. And the JJ School of Art is a unique art college in the world. It's designed as a uh, school of art and school of architecture and applied art, etc. Beautiful building. And so I went to the art department, and I, this was halfway through the semester. And I remember Mr. Gonzlecker with a bow tie and cigarette in his mouth, who studied in Royal Academy in London. So he looked at my sketches and said, sure, I'll give you admission now. So I left and sent a telegram to my father that left architecture, joined painting, sent me 500. And did he approve? Did you get the money? <laughs> yeah, I got the money. But thereafter, it continued. Your family says that, that was a period when you set yourself a target of 300 sketches a day. Well, I mentioned to them, I don't think they knew about it. But I, this was in JJ, where I uh, used to do about 300. This was, you know, like uh, romantic idealism. That I, you know, we had um, replicas of uh, Michelangelo in JJ, uh, double the life size. So I wanted to think, Michelangelo, a great artist, and I want to be like that. So you set yourself with this kind of idealism. But was uh, this discipline that you were imposing on yourself, or sure. a challenge that you were setting both, for yourself? Both, I suppose both. And that's a fervor that with which one started. Not that when you do 300 sketches, there are any work of art, but they just exercise. You but know? you took it very seriously, because I'm did. also told that when you fail to do 300, you would miss dinner as punishment. Yeah, and, but this was all self-imposed. We had to uh, uh, submit about 10 or 12 sketches um, mm -hmm. in the class. But I did all this as to save money, as to stay the YMCA, so as to walk the distance from JJ to YMCA and carry the sketchbook and you keep sketching uh, of the vegetable vendors and chanawalas and all that. So at the end of the day, your ligament would pain, you can't straighten it, so you rub it, you know. There's also yeah. a lovely story about how when you began not walking but going by train, you would frequently yeah. fall asleep and miss the station home. Yeah, that is, uh, that's a time when I was a student, but I had a studio in the Bhulaghai Memorial Institute in Warden Road in Bombay. And it's not mentioned, you know, the so-called modern art historians not aware, this was a very, very important institution where Ravi Shankar was there, Hussein came in later. And I was the only student. And Chindu. even Al-Khazi had Al-Khazi was there, Satya Dubey, Alik Padamsi, 
and uh, many Gaiton, they're the painter. So by in fact know? coincidence, the mm. atmosphere that you grew up in Mayurbhanj yeah. was being recreated Almost at the Almost like that in, in another level, in, in, in a much more sophisticated and modern... So during know. the journeys to the studio and mm. back home, That's right. because of the incredible challenges you'd set yourself, you'd simply fall asleep on you're the You're tired. Trip. At the end of the day, you're tired. You spend the whole day at the art college. Then at the Boulevard Institute. So by 11.30, you go back. Uh, uh, you know, by, by then, it's very tiring. Then I was to live in the suburb. Now, you know, over the 40 years that your career has developed, and you've had some incredible achievements in that time, people oh, often sure. say that perhaps the most significant is the mural you did for Parliament last year. Is that one that you're particularly proud of yourself? Uh, not really. I mean, I've done this 7 feet by 68 feet mural. It, it was challenging in the sense it, it had a subject. I normally don't take up commission with a subject, predetermined subject. Uh, what are the murals I've done before? They were my own concoctions. But here, in this case, being the Parliament, they told me the journey of India from Mohenjo-daro to Gandhi, which is 5,000 years of India. And I'm sure thousands of things are missing, but in 68 feet, to put 5,000 years... That was the real <laughs> challenge. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I mean, if, if I was doing that mural again, I'll do it differently, and so on. But that but is the prerogative of any artist. When you revisit sure. what you've done, you always do it differently. Sure. But, but in fact, it's not just mural and painting. I began by saying you're much more than just a painter. You're a sculptor as well. In 95, you created a 30-foot statue in steel outside in the open in Bilai. Yeah, it's not a statue. It's a sculptural welded installation. And this is the very first one. I must tell you about it. I'm not a sculptor yet. I, I want to do little clay uh, toys to go to make bronzes. The journey will need three, four years but or more. But this is the very first one which I was commissioned. The Villai Steel Plant had invited me to inaugurate something. So then they phoned me, the MD, saying that you are coming here, why not do something for us? So he sent a ticket for me to go and visit. So he said, what will you do? And came uh, in my mind was, I'll do, I want to do a sculpture in steel. You know, with the foggiest high. idea of how to do it. But they had about 25 engineers, 50 welders, the whole steel plant at my disposal. You know, this is uh, like a child in a uh, toy shop. So I, I, I think I've done too much in that roundabout. It's a 500 meter roundabout. And I'm, a, I'm frankly a very overindulgent person about everything I do. So the installation is so much that, say, about a thousand cyclists come out of the steel plant and go around, and they look and go, and it could be a traffic hazard, <laughs> what I've done, you know? <laughs> but, you know, on the other hand, right at the other extreme, you've also mm. designed miniature postage stamps. Which yeah. do you find more challenging, working on the miniature or this grand scale as you did in Bilal? You see, um, when I paint in oil, I do very large canvases. And I also enjoy very small canvas of six inches by ten inches kind of canvas, okay? Uh, the, propor the, the proposition is totally different. And it's not something is less or more. Uh, sometimes doing a small painting is difficult and some, you know, in terms of not only the scale, because it's handheld and the other has a scale. That is one aspect. And both are challenging. I don't like middle path in anything, you know? <laughs> you respond best to challenges. Uh, set by yourself, not by outside. And are powers. you constantly setting challenges for yourself, just as a way of pushing yourself that little step extra? Yes, I think I'm pushing myself a bit too much. <laughs> you, know, you also have, and for many people, this is perhaps the most intriguing side of you. You have an amazing collection of 5,000 handheld fans. Pankha. What is Pankha? <laughs> the good traditional Pankha. Yeah. What is there about the traditional Pankha that intrigues and fascinates you? You know, a friend of mine, gifted me a beautiful antique fan uh, on my birthday 20 years ago. And uh, another day, a friend of mine came and he was very morose. So I took this fan and I said, let me stir the still air. I said it. As I said, I said, that's a title for a book on hand fans. I want to make a collection. That's how it started. Everything that I do, I, I see a glimpse of the whole journey. You've got I the start. collection. The yeah. book is still to happen. That's right. But is that something you're determined to do? Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts have taken over the whole project. We're working on it. Uh, we're going to have a big show and the book and various other things, short films on the subject. This has nothing to do with my painting. And when will this show and the book happen? Uh, sometime this year. 
Well, that's something certainly people are going to wait for. I want to take a break at this point, Jatin, and come yes. back in part two and talk not about the painter, the sculptor, or the collector of funds, but the man behind it all, the real Jatin Das. We'll be back in a couple of moments. Don't go away. Welcome back. My guest is Jatin Das. Let's talk about you. When the super cyclone hit Orissa in 1999, you adopted one of the devastated villages and you immersed yourself trying to help the victims. But it turned out to be a deeply disillusioning experience, I'm told. What went wrong? See, I'm from Orissa. And I remember Raghu Rai and me, we went to B B Orissa, to Bhubaneswar. I also even carried the letter from the UN to the Chief Minister of Orissa. So I'm, I, I have a Boy Scout attitude in me. Uh, if I Notice. Anyway, so I took this letter and gave it to him, and then I saw the devastation, literally two days after the cyclone in 99. And uh, I adopted the village, and um, then I requested many people all over the country for help. Chandra Babu Naidu once telephoned me. I, I telephoned and left a message for help, and he telephones me in the morning and saying that anything you want, I'll give you. Uh, the uh, 200 cows are still in Shrikakulam, which have not been brought for the village. Everybody that I asked, they, each one of them came forward. Uh, from the Jet Airways, Naresh Trehan, the doctor, sent five doctors. But then why did it all turn south for you? You see, uh, it's very unfortunate. I'm quite embarrassed to say, Oriyas do not have a community activity, unlike the Gujaratis. I'm an Oriya. And uh, it shouldn't, one shouldn't say it in public, but you know, I can't resist but say this. Um, because you see, you have the comparison now. You have the disaster of earthquake in Gujarat, and you have the cyclone there. You're saying that people's selfishness and their individualism Politici came in the way of community Politicians effort? have spoiled the whole country at every level. Inch by inch they've spoiled. The moral fiber of this country is eroded. And you can see it during cyclone, and earthquake was it and politicians elsewhere. that actually spoiled it or was it that the people you were helping the actual villagers turned against you no were ungrateful no they've not turned against me what I, what has really happened when I say politicians have spoiled you know we say the people are spoiled in the urban areas but it has now percolated down to the villages and they were trying to grab from every volunteering agency number one and it's not only Orissa it's all over the country uh, the politicians have really spoiled them and in the villages while I was working, I did not allow any media person to go in. I said, when I finish a project, my dream was to resurrect and make a genuine, traditional uh, uh, Oriya village. The sad part yeah. is that never happened. Yeah. In fact, you had to give it up long before you completed That's right. it. That's right. That's right. How much did that shatter your illusions? Well, I, I'm a loner. I was doing collective activity. Nobody came forward to help me, really. I took the volunteers from the village. But, uh, you know, in spite of the fact I knew everybody in the administration or people in the society, you know. So for that year and a half that I worked, I went 27 times by air at my own cost. Every money, penny that I received, I spent for the village and not for myself, not even a penny. You know, you used a very interesting word to describe yourself a moment ago. You said you were a bit of a boy scout in your attitude. Yeah. Your daughter Nandita says that he's very trusting, childlike in his innocence, sometimes even naive. Would you accept all of that? No, I'm not naive, but I, I, I uh, genuinely believe that one has to trust every, everybody that you're dealing with. And I personally also believe that even if a so bad person, if you are gentle and honest with him, maybe he will convert. So I have these stupid ideas and idealism. But it sometimes doesn't work. She says, in fact, and I'm talking about your daughter Nandita again, that it's more than just sometimes. She says, often he's taken for a ride. He even knows people are lying, but because he can't prove it, he'll allow them to deceive him. It happens in life. But you know, the, um, in last, as I mentioned, 10, 15 years, Everything has changed in the country, not only in the art, in personal dealing, in pers you know, friends, uh, everything, everything has changed. Changed for the worse. Changed for the worse. It's very sad. So-called consumer society, and that quite often people use something called globalization. Tell you know, me something. Mm. 
does this Boy Scout feel sometimes that he doesn't fit into the world he lives in? No, but one has to yet function. But then another side of you says that I want still have to survive in the given situation. You see, I have a mixture of all this. I, I, I respect, uh, say, Aurobindo and Vivekananda and, you know, Tagore and all that, and, and Einstein. On the other hand, uh, I'm also a contemporary person. Are you, are you with me in what I'm saying? I come from a traditional background, and I grew up in Bombay, live in Delhi, so I have a mixture of all these uh, bastardization, you know, and yet to retain uh, the purity of your soul. It's a tough job. In fact, to retain this purity that is clearly so important to you, do you find that at times you have to make yourself a recluse? In fact, a moment ago you used that word to describe yourself as well. Yeah, you see, it's like I go to a party, I work sl uh, slog the whole day, and I think I need to forget my work, so I go to a party. I go to a party, I find it boring, then I come away. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? That, uh, that... Uh, Are you a solitary person? I, I'm a loner. Uh, but when I'm not painting, I like company. But when you are mm. painting, yeah, I the don't painting like is the only company you want? Yeah. No, the, then you're engrossed. You're engrossed in the work. I, I mean, uh, I don't need music, I don't need drinks, I don't need anybody, you know? When you say you're a loner, are you also a bit of a rebel? Or is it just that you don't like the world you see around you increasingly? Um, uh, rebel in the sense I like, I'm, I'm being always forthright. I've uh, been outspoken, and many of my friends have said, Oh, Jathin, if there's no need, you don't have to say it. You know, you, you, might, you might recollect about three years ago uh, uh, for something about Hussein's painting, and many artists, we all went there, and uh, the mob was saying something which was horrifying, to which point I said, Aap aise kyun baat kar rahe? That's all I said at that pitch, and they ran after me. Are you yeah. happy with the way you are, or do you sometimes regret that you've perhaps been pushed into a groove and pushed into a path? You see, I, I, I have not compromised knowingly ever in my life. But in day-to-day -day life, you compromise to some extent. But in my, uh, in my ethics, in my values, I've stood by it, what I believe in. You know, not in a puritanic way, but because I believe in it. But hence you become a loner because the whole consumer society is in another direction altogether. Chattandas for sharing your life with us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah.